Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Folks, this is an exciting time to be alive. God is at work. Yes, there are terrible things happening in our world. I mean, this is the time Paul spoke about when he said, in the last days, peerless. And the word peerless means fierce. It's the word that was used uh, of the two demoniacs in the Gospels. These two demoniacs that lived in the cemetery and they terrorized that whole area and people made a wide berth around them. They were described as fierce. And Paul said, use this word to characterize the last days. But he also said, or the scriptures also say, the last days would be a time when God would be pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. Jesus said the last days would be a time when there would be great gospel activity activity for in Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 Jesus himself said and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and the word nations there is ethnos from which we get ethnicity so when Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations he wasn't talking about nations such as we have today with these political geographical borders. He was talking about ethnic groups. And he said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to every ethnicity, and then the end shall come. Well, so folks, this is an exciting time to be alive. Yes, there are terrible, horrific things happening in the world. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in places like Iraq, Syria, and Iran who are suffering horrific persecutions, persecutions and tortures, pray that their faith will be strengthened and their faith will not fail, but that they will be witnesses unto Jesus even in the face of death. Who knows that some of us may have to come to that place at some point. But pray for them. As Jesus prayed for Peter before his time of great trial, Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. So I pray that these uh, Christians, these followers of Jesus in these countries. Uh, so, which, am I on this one, Sue? Okay. <laughs> Sue's pointing at a camera. Apparently, she's got me on another camera. Uh, pray that their faith will not fail, but that they will be witnesses unto Jesus, even in the face of death. So, Lord, we ask you to do that now. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Syria, Iraq, Iran, and these places that even right now, tonight, that their faith will be strengthened, that there will be a supernatural power and boldness come into their hearts and lives to be your witnesses. And Lord, we do ask you to bring, to send help and deliverance to them, I pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So my point is, this is an exciting time, folks, to be alive. And uh, God is moving. He's pouring out His Spirit all over the world. And uh, in Acts chapter 16, I'm going to continue today about characteristics. Characteristics of a GWTW chapter 29. Now some of you, if you're logged on new, may not know what I'm talking about. But this fall, we're going to launch chapters or groups. And as of right now, we're calling them a chapter 29. Each group a chapter 29 referring to the fact that Acts has 28 chapters. Acts is a history, the earliest history of the church. And it, it has no finality, has no ending, no closing. It just ends in the middle of a story. And uh, I believe it's because it's really the name is really the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has never stopped working. And you and I are, are in a sense writing our own Acts 29. The Acts of the Holy Spirit through Eddie, through Sue, through Stephen, uh, through Richard, through Paul and Eileen. I could go on and name names, names, but I will just go ahead and stop right there. Uh, but God is writing Acts chapter 29 through you and I today. And what an exciting time to be alive. And let's, let's maximize this moment in time. Let's give it our all. Give our all to God and let Him use us in this hour for His glory and for His kingdom. Hallelujah. And I'm going to go ahead and read what I, I wrote this today. I wrote it down when I was praying and thinking about tonight, that this vision, and here's what I said, I envision GWTW chapter 29 groups. 
And, and these groups may look differently in different places according to the, the need in this, the, the particular location. These, these are not cookie cutter groups, um, and, or, so to speak. But I envision GWTW chapter 29 groups being formed all over the world. We know that God has spoken that this message of Bible-based gender equality in Christ is a key for reaching the Muslim world. According to statistics, over a billion Muslims in the world today, millions right here in America. And, and there is no question that God has said this message I've entrusted to you and revealing to you is a key for reaching the Muslim world whom Jesus died for, shed his blood for. So we have a responsibility. And I envision these chapters being formed in Muslim countries such as Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Indonesia. And by the way, the God's Word to Women website, it still is receiving over 20,000 visits every month from countries all over the world, from over a hundred countries, including these Muslim countries that I just listed, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Indonesia, and so on. And I envision these chapters being formed in, in these countries, including others, America, Canada, Ireland, England, and so on. And what will we do? We will provide them teaching tools, outlines, videos, whatever. We'll provide prayer support, some general guidelines, and we'll just encourage them just to go for it. Do it. Just do it. And here's another thing I said. It is very important that the members of these groups have a clear understanding that the leadership of the group is not gender-based. It, it, it's based on God's calling in their life, God's gift and calling in the person's life. So therefore, it can be a, a woman or it can be a man. But in some regions where male dominance is so deeply ingrained in the culture, in other words, it's just a way of life that, that a man always has to be in charge. It's like that in some parts of the church in America today. In a place like that, then we may have to push and prod the women to take leadership of the chapters in order to break the cultural and traditional stranglehold off their lives so that the church can multiply and expand in these countries and see the work happen that God wants to do to, to release these people and to bring them in to his kingdom. So, so my friends, this is an exciting day, exciting time, and I hope you're on board with us. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to, to email or whatever, and uh, we'll be glad to share with you. Now, the name of the lesson today, I called it this, How Christian Women Change the Ancient World and How They Can Do It Today. And here's a quote from Gerald Hawthorne. This is relative today because I'm going to talk about how that the, ch the first church in Europe was started with women, by women. And the, the, the church in Philippi is in Macedonia. And this is from a, a, uh, a very well-known commentary, biblical commentary series called the Word Biblical Commentary. And uh, this particular scholar said this, he said, certainly it is clear from the Acts account that women played a noteworthy role in the founding and establishing of the Macedonian churches. You're so right there, Gerald Hawthorne. Oh, thank you, Lord. What a, folks, this is, this is an exciting day to be alive. I know there are terrible things happening in the world, but I feel to emphasize it again. Do not become, yes, it's good to keep up on affairs in the world and what's happening, but do not get preoccupied with all the bad things happening in the world so that your spirit and your heart is pulled down and is dragged down into a place of melancholy and, and, and where that you, you lose hope and, and, and despair. No, look up, your redemption draweth nigh, and look up with expectation and expect God to pour out His Spirit as He has promised. That's where we are here at Hyatt International Ministries and God's Word to Women here in Grapevine, Texas. Now, if you look at Roman numeral 1 in Acts chapter 16, I'm, I think I'll start reading in, in verse 6 of Acts 16. This is actually Paul's second missionary journey. 
And he's well into the second missionary journey where we're going to start reading. And it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now that is a, that, this shows how that the Holy Spirit can be very precise. Now let me say this. Don't expect God to give you precise revelation for everything that you're supposed to do in life. He gave you a brain with common sense. Don't expect God, you get up in the morning to tell you which shirt to put on, uh, which pair of pants to put on, and this sort of thing, what pair of underwear to put on. God gave you a brain with common sense and he expects you to use it. But when you do need precise direction, he can give it. And in this situation, Paul needed some precise direction. God wanted him in a certain place. Now what this shows was Paul wasn't waiting for precise direction. He was taking initiative on his own, trusting God, but he was allowing God to make corrections and adjustments as he was proceeding along the way, fulfilling the general call God had given him. It's sort of like an airplane pilot that takes off from Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport and he's flying to London, we'll say. And Sue and I have made that trip before. He knows where he's going, he heads in that direction, but he makes adjustments, he makes corrections along the way. And uh, so Paul, has taken initiative on his own. We see this back in Acts 15. But he's allowing God to make corrections to his direction along the way. He's not being passive. He's moving his feet, but God is adjusting his way. And so verse 6 says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit pre to preach the word in Asia. Why in the world would God forbid Paul to preach the word in Asia. Now many people would have said, I rebuke you devil, How, the dev, the God would never tell me not to preach the word to some people. Yes, he would if there's some other people who are ready for it and these people where you're going to, they're not ready for it. God knows they're not going to receive it, but he knows some people over here are ready to receive it. Yes, he will say, no, don't go there. I want you to go over here because these people are ready. My friends, God is a whole lot smarter than we are and we need to learn to be sensitive to him and to listen to him and, de and develop a sensitivity to him. And so when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Okay. Yes, Sue has the map up. So uh, they are in, first of all, they're in this area here. Uh, way down here is Jerusalem. Here's the Mediterranean. Over here is Jerusalem. Here is Antioch of Syria, where they proceeded from on their first and second missionary journeys, Paul and Silas on the second one, and they traveled through this area uh, preaching the gospel. And then when they started to go down in this area of uh, where I'm looking for Ephesus, uh, it's down here on the coast, uh, a little higher, there it is right, right in here, uh, the Holy Spirit stopped them. And then they started to go to another area back up this way, and the Holy Spirit stopped them again. So, But Paul did not become passive. He kept moving, so he headed up this way. And my friend, if we're totally yielded to God and looking to Him and just obey Him, if He puts up a red light, stop. Don't go there. Go in another direction. And if He puts up another red light, don't go there <laughs> in another direction. Somewhere along the way, if we're... If our heart is to obey him, he will show us where he wants us to go. And this is what happened to Paul. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. But they kept moving. I saw a, a, a poster one time said, God will order our steps if we will first move our feet. <laughs> Paul has had a general commission from God to take the gospel to the Gentile world. He's moving his feet. And God is ordering his steps. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And here is Troas way up here. Now this is present day 
Turkey. And, um, and at Troas, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded. In other words, the man was in earnest. And he was saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, Macedonia, come over. It's a totally different region. In, in fact, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's back over in this area. This is where they're going to go. Uh, uh, Macedonia yeah. is north of Greece. And um, we were 10 miles from there. yeah, uh, we, I preached just, just a little ways north of Philippi back in, I think it was 2012, was it? Or 2008, I think. Boy, you lose track of time. I was telling somebody recently, the older I get, it seems the time goes by more, more swiftly. Uh, but I remember preaching in a church in Bulgaria, and I knew we were not far from some of these cities where Paul preached. And I, and I, and I was preaching, I, I guess, out of this passage, and I mentioned Philippi, and I said, how far are we from Philippi? And they said, it's 50 miles south of here. Well, In Kistendil, I think we were only 10 miles from the border. Kistendil, we were only, yeah, that's right, Sue. So, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him. There was an urgency to his voice. And he said, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so it says, now after he had seen the vision, and he, he shared it with the others there. Now up until this time, there are three people with Paul. But now there's a fourth one that joins them. He left Antioch of Syria... In Acts chapter 15, verse 36, he and Silas, Paul and Barnabas had a falling out, and then Silas joined him. And he and Silas departed Antioch of Syria. In Acts 16, verses 1 through 3, they picked up Timothy, and Timothy began to travel with them. And the writer of Acts, which is Luke, he uses third person pronouns up until up until verse 10 that we just read. Up until then it's they and them. But beginning in verse 10 it's we and us. Showing that in Troas Luke joined up with Paul and his team. And now there are four in this team, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And Luke says, now after he had seen the vision, immediately we, notice we, sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Wow, I love this. Only Paul saw the vision. But Luke said when he shared the vision <laughs> with us, we knew it wasn't just Paul's call, we were all called. Because he said immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the, the Lord had called us to preach the gospel. And I know surely as I'm sitting here tonight that, that, that I can say for many of you, and you sense this, that God has called us to carry out this mission. Verse 11, therefore sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, which is on the coast. Okay. And, uh, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, Philippi. Now, this is where we get into some interesting things. So if you have your outline, I'm going to go back and forth from the scripture to the outline. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, I want us to see this picture. Normally, when Paul would go to a city, the first place he would go would be the synagogue. Why? Because he had an opening there. He had a receptivity there. He wouldn't go to some Jewish club or some... some I'm sorry... He wouldn't go to some pagan club or some pagan social meeting because he as a Jew would not be accepted there. There would be no recognition there. He went where he had an opening because he was Jewish. And, in, and back in Jerusalem, he was a well-known teacher. He had been a Pharisee, a, a, a well-known student of the law, a well-known teacher, a rabbi. 
and his reputation had spread outside of Israel. So he had an opening when he would go to these cities with the Jewish community. So he would head for the synagogue. Eddie, I think the uh, I think that the um, application for us is that uh, we have certain groups or certain people mm -hmm. that we can best relate to, right? Who can best receive yeah. from us, and we can understand how the people think and so on and so forth so we can more effectively communicate right so this is what paul was doing wasn't it it was yeah is he was going to people with whom he could best communicate yes absolutely and that's one reason that when we get opportunities to go to groups or to countries where we're not maybe in uh, tune with the culture I, for example, I had an I have a standing opportunity to teach my course in Indonesia, mm -hmm. and I said to the pastor, I said, "No, here's the material. You know how to reach your people mm -hmm. a lot better than I do. Right. So please take this, digest it, and then feed it to the and people you teach it. the way that you <laughs> in their know. language exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this is what Paul was doing and that's the application I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's not to say that we should never go to another culture or to another oh, place. That's not what I'm saying. But our probably our most effective uh, communication will be amongst those who mm -hmm. that we best understand. Yeah, that's that's where we start. Yeah, absolutely, Sue, that's good. Now, it says, on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city, this is verse 13, to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke with the women. Philippi was a Roman colony. In other words, Rome had settled this city, and, and Rome had established this city and settled it uh, primarily with veterans of their army, soldiers, retired soldiers and so on, and other people who were Roman citizens. So the inhabitants there, many of them were Roman citizens, and they were very proud of their Roman citizenship, and they were very diligent in, in, in expressing and carrying out Roman laws and Roman heritage. You will see this expressed later on. And, and there is apparently a very small Jewish community there, maybe only a few families. And this is why there's not a synagogue. According to Jewish tradition at this time, not Jewish scripture, but Jewish tradition, they would only build a synagogue if there were 10 heads of households in a city. In other words, 10 men. If they could find 10 men who were heads of households in a city, then that provided a quorum and they would build a synagogue. So obviously there were not 10 Jewish men in this city to provide the quorum to build a synagogue. So there were some people who just met and obviously it's all women and these would have been not necessarily all Jewish women because Jewish synagogues were made up of three kinds of people and you see this behind me on the screen they were made up of Jews who were uh, native born Jews they were made up of proselytes and these would have been people who had converted they were not born Jews but they had converted to Judaism for all practical purposes, they had become Jews. The men had become circumcised, and they had dedicated themselves to keep all of the Jewish laws, the feasts, the festivals, attend the synagogue, and all of this. But then there was a third group that they were known as God-fearers. Sometimes they're called God-worshippers. And these were the Gentiles who were attracted to the God of Israel. They were attracted to the worship of one God because the pagans of that day, they believed in the supernatural, they believed in gods, plural. <coughs> they worshiped many gods, but there were some in the Gentile world, among those, they were attracted to the God of Israel, and they would attend the synagogues. They were not ready to go all the way and become a proselyte and, and make that commitment to Judaism to become a Jew in every way, but they were intrigued and attracted to the to the God of Israel and they would attend the synagogues and even support in other ways and they were referred to as God fearers and so one thing we learn from Luke is that there were no men that were meeting in this place of prayer 
And it could have been a place, there may have been a shelter that had been there or some kind of, of a makeshift tabernacle, but there was not a synagogue. There was just a place of prayer that these women were meeting together. Now, some preachers today would have said, well, we need to move on. We can't start a church with a bunch of women, you know, because, you know, we got to have some men to have the proper order and have a man to have a, to pastor this group, so we can't do anything here. We need to move on to the next town. That's not, that, that wasn't Paul's idea. That may, that may be the idea of some modern preachers and, and bishops and evangelists and popes and so on. But it's not a biblical, it is not a New Testament, it is not the attitude that Paul had. What did Paul do? Uh, Eddie, before you go on with that, I just uh, keep thinking of, the, of Elizabeth Baker and, the, yeah. and her five, I believe it was four or five, yeah. sisters in Rochester, New York. True. In, at the turn of the century, they felt strongly to start a work, and it was, they had a Bible college, and they had a good church, mm -hmm. but they, they felt like, oh, they couldn't do this because they were women, and they kept looking for a man <laughs> to come along to take over the ministry, and finally they got the message from the Lord. He said, they heard him say, no, you don't need a man in this, you know, to lead this ministry. I've called you to do it. So Elizabeth Duncan Baker was the main uh, leader, but all of her sisters uh, were involved and did a, an amazing work. Now, when they became too old, rather than trying to find someone to pick it up, they just closed it down. Now, some from that that work went on to Lima, New mm -hmm. York, and started the Bible College there. I forget what it's called. Elam. Elam Bible College, yeah. right. So there was an example, and there are so many others in history, and this is why I like to study God's women in history, because we see the struggles. You know, Phoebe Palmer, whom we'll learn more about as we go along, uh, Phoebe Palmer was the leader of the great holiness revival of the 1800s. Mm -hmm. She never claimed to preach she always gave talks right. but the people would flock <laughs> to the great altars revivals, yeah. give themselves to the lord speak in tongues experience all the manifestations of the spirit and walk out and live holy lives her husband who was a medical doctor recognized the call of god on her life so much that he shut down his medical practice in New York City and quote unquote carried her suitcases. They spent four years in England, saw incredible outpourings. But you see, because of what the church has done to shut women out of primary positions, mm -hmm. right. she was one who thought, oh, I just give talks. She got the job done though. But how much more could she have done if there had been more receptivity? to the gift and calling God had given her. And uh, she knew she was preaching, but it was to try to keep from offending so much of the sensibilities and the wrong theology that was so prevalent in her day that women could not preach and lead and so on. And, uh, but so, she was so, not apologetic. She was not apologetic, no, was she? No, that's true. She, but she wasn't, no. She just did it. And she you just will get it. to that phrase as you bring your, your teaching to a close tonight. She just did it. Yeah. And that's what we need to do, not be caught up in all of this nonsense and fighting and quarreling and contending. Just do just it. Just do it. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. If you got the gift, the call, the unction, just do, do it. it. <laughs> and that, that reminds me, uh, I preached in a church numerous times for our friend Gloria Gillespie down in uh, uh, Burleson, Texas, and in the 1970s she started a youth ministry and was seeing all kinds of young people, back in the, the Jesus people days, were getting saved and delivered from drugs and so on, and you, you know, and uh, she, she, she didn't know what to do with them. She was sharing the gospel with them, and of course they were looking to her, you know, for guidance and so on, so she tried taking them to churches, and some of you will remember those days, and some of these kids, they had real long hair and they didn't dress all that well and some of them smelled and, and some churches told her not to bring those kids in there and so on. And uh, so then, so the next thing to do, she started asking God to send a man to pastor them. She said, God never answered that prayer. <laughs> she, and, uh, and so eventually God showed her, no, you are the one to pastor them. 
And uh, she pastored that church, became a very successful church, pastored it for many years. She has recently retired and turned it over to somebody else. But yeah, that's what we're talking about. Shake off the bonds. Shake off the restraints. Just do it. If God's called you, just go do it. Hallelujah. Now, so on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And I love this. This, this shows the personableness of Paul. This shows how Paul, he didn't have a problem sitting down and conversing with women. We have this idea because of a couple of passages in Paul that have been misinterpreted and taken out of context that Paul was some sort of misogynist that hated women and so on. No, Paul had intimate, now I'm not talking anything physical, but Paul had very close relationships with different women that comes out very clearly in Acts and in his letters. And there's something uh, that we see in Paul's attitude here. Luke says they sat down. They didn't try to preach a sermon to these women. They didn't try to invite them to where they were going to have a meeting. No, Paul and the other three, they sat down and they had face-to-face -face talks and conversations with these women and just shared with them in an informal way the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and Luke says that, that they all did this. Now, apparently Paul maybe was having the most success because he highlights Paul's conversation in verse 14. He says, now a certain woman. There were women, plural there, but then he wants to emphasize a certain woman. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. And by the way, if, if Sue wants to bring up the map, we'll show you where Thyatira was who worshiped God. Now this indicates that she was not a Jew by birth. She was one of these God-fearers, a worshiper of God. Thyatira is, is right here. Now where she is at this time uh, is in Philippi, way over here in this area, uh, just north of Greece in Macedonia. And so she's, she's come quite a ways. And uh, she obviously is a businesswoman of, of some means. She's a wealthy businesswoman. This is going to come out here as, as we read this. But it says now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart. Oh, it's wonderful when God opens people's hearts. <laughs> oh, I pray that God will open people's hearts I don't know who's on this stream. I know some of you, I know God's already opened your hearts. May he continue to open our hearts to his truth. And you know, because, you know, it's not just, it's not just a mental thing of ascertaining and understanding truth. It is a heart thing. I'm going to say that again. It's not just a head thing. It's a heart thing. Because when Jesus sent Mary Magdalene and the other women, he appeared to them first and sent them to tell Peter, John, James, and, and the other male disciples that he was alive. They, the scripture says they didn't believe them. They wouldn't accept the message from these women. Showed the bias and prejudice. And that's, I have no doubt that's why Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene and sent her to tell my brethren. He could have appeared to them, but no, he chose not to. He chose to appear to Mary Magdalene and the other women and give them the honor of being the first to bear the good news of the resurrection. Jesus chose women first. And now today the, the church puts them last, but Jesus chose them first to bear Ooh. the good news. Well, and we do just the opposite today. But um, it says later that... It says, the gospel says, I think it's Luke's gospel, said they didn't believe it, what the women said. Oh, well, that's nothing new. <laughs> yeah, she says that's nothing new. But then later when Jesus appeared to the men, to the twelve. Sorry, I shouldn't be so cynical. I it repent. says that he upbraided them and rebuked them, not because they didn't understand it, but it says he rebuked them for their hardness of heart because they did not believe what the women had told them. 
The problem was not an intellectual problem. It wasn't a problem of not being able to understand the message. Their problem was a heart problem, a hardness of heart, not willing to receive the message through a woman. This is what we are dealing with in the church today. One of the things. Hallelujah. One of the things who says. That's true. Now here's the thing I want to say here. Now this woman of Thyatira, it says, verse 15, and when she and her household were baptized. Now, you have to realize there could be several days involved in this because she would have had to share the gospel with her household. And when the Bible talks about a household, it's not talking about a nuclear family, a mother and father and two or three kids. <laughs> a household consisted of children. It, it would consist of extended families, a mother, a father, maybe aunts, uncles, maybe cousins. It would consist of servants and slaves and their families. And depending on how wealthy and aristocratic the, the head of the household was, a, a household could consist of hundreds of people. And in those days, it, you know, certain households, it could be considered an honor to be a, a part of a certain household if this household was wealthy and had prominence in the culture. Now, apparently her household was quite large and apparently she had a large estate. By the way, I might just mention that it says that she was a seller of purple. Thyatira was well known for a certain kind of dye that was produced there from a certain kind of shellfish. And it, it had to be extracted a drop at a time. And it was very rare and it was very valuable and it was used very much by wealthy people and particularly by royalty, by kings and, and, and people of royalty would buy this to dye their clothing with. And she was a seller, a merchant of this and apparently had done very well by this. And she had this large household. And it was large enough that, it, that, uh, that uh, Luke says, and when she and her household, so we don't know any details of how she became the head of this household, but Luke says she and her household. She was the head of this household. When she and her household were baptized, she begged us, she pleaded. Oh, her heart was so deeply touched by the word of God and the presence of God, she wanted to support this thing that she had become a part of. She wanted to be a part of it and support it. And Luke says she begged us. You know, Paul, you see this in his other letters, he never wanted to be a burden to any of the places where he brought the gospel so he could never be accused of, of doing this for money and, and taking from the people. And he would make tents and work with his hands to keep from doing this. But in this situation, Paul did not feel that he had to give himself to, to some other occupation because this woman, this wealthy woman, she begged and pleaded with them to come to her house and let her host them. And, and, and listen to this, verse 15, And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord. So there has been some time for them, so uh, apparently some time, days, maybe weeks have transpired, for them to evaluate her walk with the Lord and her attitude and her expressions. Because she said, If you have found me, or judged me, evaluated me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And Luke says, so she persuaded us. She talked us into it. So she had a big enough estate that she had no problem hosting four grown men and, and, and having place for them to stay, providing accommodations and providing for their needs. Verse 16, so she would have been from the upper classes of Philippi. Now, the church, by the way, this is the first Christian community, ecclesia, Greek word ecclesia, the first congregation, the first Christian community congregation in Europe begins with a women's prayer meeting. 
and the first meeting place for the first congregation, the first church, the first congregation in Europe is in a woman's home. Christianity in Europe begins with women. Paul had no problem beginning a work with women. How can I say that this became the meeting place? Yeah, they still apparently went to this place of prayer because this was a well-known place where people would gather. But Lydia's house became a gathering place because later when Paul and Silas were thrown into prison, and maybe we'll talk about that in a moment, and then they were supernaturally delivered. Where is the first place they went to after they were delivered? Go over towards the end of the chapter to verse 40, Acts 16 and 40. And it says, so when they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. <laughs> Where's the first place they went when they left the prison? To Lydia's house. That was, that was the gathering place. That was the place where they were congregating. And when they had seen the brethren, it's the Greek word adelphoi, which is gender inclusive, literally, and when they had seen the brothers and sisters, the brothers and sisters had all gathered together in the house of Lydia. What is a gathering together of the brothers and sisters? It's church. <laughs> so here the first church in Europe is taking place in a woman's home. Now don't you dare try to impose this ridiculous idea that this successful businesswoman who has opened her house to the gospel and as a gathering place and whom Paul has accepted her invitation don't tell me that when they gathered, she had to sit over in the corner and be quiet. That is so ridiculous. That did not happen. Paul had no problem. There's no question in my mind that Lydia was a leader, perhaps a pastor, one of the pastors and leaders of the church in Philippi, because later when Paul wrote a letter, some years later when he was in prison again in Rome, he wrote a letter to the church in Philippi and in chapter 4 he exhorted them, he said, help those women who labored at my side in the gospel. I have no question that one of those women was Lydia. Well, let's go ahead and look at that in the outline. This is so important. Roman numeral 3. I feel like I should just touch on this slave girl for, for whatever reason. And there may be something that the Holy Spirit wants to share with somebody. But I guess what I'm saying here, these chapter 29 groups that are going to be formed, I believe this folks going to be formed all over the world. Because we already have contacts in Muslim countries all over the world, and I believe there are people that will want to form these groups. You know, I, I have read that there is a tremendous hunger and that there is revival taking place in Iran. Iran is not Arabic, it's Persian. It's the ancient Persians. Those wise men who came and gave gifts to the, the, the baby Jesus, the child Jesus that we read about in the Gospels, they were from Persia. They were Persians. That's where they came from. They came from the East. And I've been told that there's a great revival, there's a real hunger for God in Iran. And of course, it has to go underground it can't be out in the open because of the outward persecutions, but I've been told that. I believe that there will be some of these GWTW chapter 29s in Iran. I, I expect that. I believe it. But I'm sharing this message tonight because they are going to share this message that we're talking about. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, that that is not the issue the issue is getting out the gospel of Jesus Christ and recognizing people's gifts and callings, whether they're a man or a woman, accepting their gifts and recognizing their gifts. And this is what we see Paul's approach in Philippi. Many church leaders today would never have stopped and started a work in Philippi. 
because they're so prejudiced against women being able to be leaders in the church. Paul wasn't like that. And do not allow those two sometimes called problem passages, 1 Corinthians 15, 34, and 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, do not let those two passages distort your thinking to the place where those two passages become the paradigm where you interpret everything else that Paul wrote and everything that Luke wrote about Paul, you interpret all of them in the light of those two passages. No, do not do that. That is not good Bible interpretation. Put those two aside. Look at what I'm telling you. Look at everything else Paul said. Look at what Luke said about Paul. And then interpret those two in the light of what we're seeing about Paul here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read about this slave girl. Paul says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination, literally a spirit of python, met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and, Paul and us. Now I have an article, an in-depth article about this incident on my blog, which is called, uh, it's, it's www.biblicalawakening.blogspot.com. It's also on the God's Word to Women blog, which explains this situation. It's called The Spirit of Python why we need to recognize the false spirit of prophecy in the church today. And this girl had a spirit, the Greek says a spirit of Python, which those first readers understood this because prophecy was a very common and popular activity among the ancient Greeks and Romans. In the ancient world, they believed in the supernatural. They believed in the gift of prophecy. Pagan prophecy Usually, the prophet or the prophetess went out of their head, out of their mind. They called it mania. They went mad. They, they sort of lost their, they, they went into what we'd call today an altered state of consciousness. The Greek word is, is ecstasy. And some paintings from the ancient world will show some of these ancient prophetesses in this spaced out look with their hair all disheveled and so on. And this was one of the differences between pagan prophecy and Christian prophecy. The person who prophesied in Christian, they didn't go out of their head. They still had all of their, their uh, normal mental faculties about them. But this spirit of prophecy, one of the most popular ones was in a city called Delphi. It was called, it was, it was called the Oracle at Delphi and they claimed to prophesy by a spirit they called the spirit of Python. Now, again, I'm not going to go into the detail, but if you want that article, go to the blogs and you can read about it there. So the first readers that read the book of Acts, they would understand, they would make a connection that this girl had the same kind of spirit as these pagan prophets and prophetesses. And, and this girl followed Paul in us, Luke says, verse 17, and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. What she prophesied was right. What she prophesied was actually flattering. These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to show us the way of salvation. Some church leaders today are so hungry for affirmation and so on, they would have put this girl on their staff and put her in charge uh, of communications and so on. <laughs> but my friends, be careful of a spirit of flattery that will sometimes show up as prophecy. Wants to flatter you, to get your attention, to pull you in. I heard a well-known preacher, he's gone on to be with the Lord, very well-known uh, evangelist in the healing revivals of the 1950s and 60s. I went to Israel with him back in the early 1970s. I said he's going to be with the Lord. And he pastored a large church in, in, in Dallas for many years. But I heard him say many, many years ago, he said, <laughs> and he, he was always having in guest preachers. And he made this statement one time. He said, every time I get a good person on my staff, he says, somebody will come through 
and prophesied to them that they have a, a that God's given them a ministry greater than Elijah, and he said they take off. And he was referring to this this flattering spirit. Don't be taken in by a spirit of flattery, especially if you are a Christian leader. This girl followed Paul and us. Now we all need encouragement. We all need affirmation, and we should encourage one another, and we should affirm one another. Yes, yes, always. But a spirit of, how do you tell the difference? Flattery is always self-serving and it is insincere. It's self-serving and it's insincere. A person who flatters, they do it for themselves, for what they can get out of it. Yes, my friends, let's be sincere. Let's sincerely encourage one another. Let's sincerely affirm one another. But watch out because this spirit is in the world today. Verse 18, and this she did for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed. His spirit was grieved. What she said was good. What she said was true. There's this idea today, there are even so-called spirit-filled leaders. They have this idea that all truth is from God. So it's okay to read, you know, maybe read some of these New Age authors. Maybe they have some truth and we could learn something from them because all truth is from God. If that had been Paul's attitude and his approach, he would have taken this young woman on board because what she was saying was the truth. But no, Paul was concerned about the source because if the source is bad, then the river eventually is going to be bad. It's going to wind up bad. No matter if there are some good things around along the way, if the source is bad, it needs to be dealt with. And Paul was not willing to be flattered by a false spirit. And so his spirit was grieved and he turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He did not speak to the girl. He spoke to the spirit. I will say that again. He did not speak to the girl. He spoke to the spirit. And he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And if you are a born again follower of Jesus Christ committed to him, you have that same authority that Paul spoke with. Don't go around looking for demons. But if you come across one like Paul did, in, with boldness, knowing that you belong to Jesus, you can command the Spirit to come out in the name of Jesus and the Spirit has to obey you just like it obeyed Paul because Paul didn't have something you don't have if you too are a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it says, and he, that is the Spirit, came out that very hour. Wow. Somebody needed to hear that right now. I know it. Somebody needed to hear that. I just sense... I just sense it in my heart. Somebody needed to be reminded that you have authority through the name of Jesus. Don't go around looking for demons, but I tell you, sometimes we are all attacked by spiritual forces, and sometimes we need to recognize that maybe something we're going through, there is a demonic dimension to it that's, that's stirring it up, and we need to stand up and face this thing, and like Paul says, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, get out of here, come out of her, come out of him, get out of here in the name of Jesus. And James chapter four and verse seven says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, he will run from you in terror, hallelujah. Or oh, it may bring some problems, now, it brought some more problems on Paul and Silas because she no longer had that supernatural ability to tell fortunes. Now here's what I want to say. The demon was giving her the ability to reveal things about people, but always remember this. The devil is not omnipotent. He doesn't know everything. Psychics today, I think some of it is just soulish. Some of it is just manipulation. Some of it is just pulling the wool over people's eyes, some of these psychics today, and, and even s some Christian prophecy, it, that's all it is. But there are some psychics, no doubt they have a spirit of python, a spirit of divination, a, spirit, a familiar spirit like these people. But these spirits are not omnipotent. They don't know everything. They know just enough to pull people in 
to impress people and to get people further into their demonic clutches. So my friend, do not look to horoscopes, do not look to psychics, do not look to astrology for guidance or direction of your future. Look to Jesus Christ, look to his word, trust in his Holy Spirit, dispense with these other things. They will only pull you deeper away from God and into Satan's clutches. Now, she no longer had those fortune-telling abilities. And so she was a slave and her masters made a lot of money and they lost, their, they, they lost their income from her. They were infuriated. And this is when they had Paul and Silas arrested. And they were dragged before the magistrates of this city. And look at verse 20. And they brought them to the magistrates, the rulers of the city, and they said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Can you imagine? Eddie, before you go on with that story, um, I think it's interesting that you've spoken of two women, Lydia, mm -hmm. who was a leader, yes, and Paul connected with her. Now you went on to a second woman, mm -hmm. this uh, prophetess, yes, pagan prophetess, right. And it's just so interesting. We know that uh, Luke, in his Gospel of Luke, yes, and in his Luke Acts, his Acts, he. Uh, he almost, uh, he promotes women. He does, yeah. He, he, I he, he, he didn't emphasizes. notice that until I was studying at, uh, in seminary and I, I almost did my master's thesis on uh, Luke's um, promotion of women. He, how can I say it, he didn't, he promoted them. He brought them into their, the position. He made us aware in his writing of the position that women were actually playing in the early yeah. church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he he did a great job, and he we, did. and you're bringing that out. Yeah. And I think that it's important to help people to see the thread that's going through here because I remember a few days ago, you said that you were out walking and praying, mm -hmm. and you felt that the Lord was impressing on you to share with the streaming family mm -hmm. how Luke promoted yeah, women. Right. And so without you really stating that thesis tonight, that's what you're doing. Yeah, and absolutely. I don't want anyone to miss that fact. Yeah. Um, and and it, you know, a wonderful book could be written about the the women in Luke's life. Yeah. True. Okay? Yeah. All right. That was my That's good, so that's good. Yes. Uh, I want you to see tonight that the church in Europe began with women and so on. Now, you don't want to get into a whole lot Here's of something I want to say. They they were be they were beaten. The magistrates look verse 22. The multitude rose up together against them. We got to wind this up and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. This goes on, no doubt, for hours. They're arrested, they're dragged before the magistrates, the people bring these accusations, they're found guilty, they tear their clothes off, they beat them with rods, their, their backs are blooded and, and bruised and beaten, they throw them into the prison, they're there. And here's what I want to say, don't quit, don't stop, persevere until you see you're suddenly from God. God does not always come through just when we would like for him to. Sometimes, I don't know why, we have to go through some things. But never stop, never quit, never throw in the towel, persevere. This is what Paul and Silas did. They didn't stop, they didn't quit. They didn't get into a pity party. They did not begin to bemoan themselves and their fate and why did this happen to us. But it says, verse 25, but at midnight, and there's no question in my mind that they had been praying and singing for a while. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. When the midnight hour came, they were. They were. This is what they were doing. They were praying and singing praises. 
New King James says hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. This is something very interesting I discovered today. The word listening there, the Greek word, means to listen with pleasure. <laughs> As when somebody is listening to a beautiful song that brings pleasure to their ears and to their soul. And it says they were praying and singing praises to God and the prisoners were listening with pleasure. They were enjoying this. I have no doubt that God's Spirit was working and touching them. And this is all a part of God birthing the ecclesia, the congregation, the community, the church in Philippi. And now the sun. And maybe you feel like you're in your midnight hour. Maybe you feel beaten up in life. I want to encourage you with these words. Don't quit. Don't stop. Persevere. Continue. Keep praying. Keep singing praises to God until you see your suddenly. Verse 26, Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open, everything, everyone's chains were loosed the jailer and his entire family came to faith in Jesus Christ, became a part of that Christian community. When it was day, the magistrates sent word to the jailer, said, you can let those, those people go free. And the, the jailer said to Paul, he said, now, he, now he's just become a Christian. He's a pagan. He's not a, a God-fearer. He's a pagan. But he's just come to faith in Christ. He says, Paul, go in peace. And Paul, go without causing any turmoil. And Paul said, no, I'm not leaving. They have beaten us openly and uncondemned as Romans. They have violated our judicial rights as Romans. So no, we're not leaving. And so when the messengers went back and said, these men you have beaten in prison, they're Romans, because Paul and Silas were both Roman prisoners. And, and in Roman law, you could not beat and imprison Roman citizens without giving them a a proper trial and due process and they had not done that for Paul and Silas because they assumed because they were Jews that they were not Romans well now the magistrates are in fear and so Paul said no we're not leaving if they want us to leave let them come over and bring us out so they required that the leaders of the city come over and give them a personal escort out of the jail and I think one reason that Paul did this, it wasn't just for himself, it was for this Christian community he was leaving behind. In other words, they are not going to be associated with these two Jews that were beaten publicly. Now they're going to be associated with these two Roman citizens that were given a public escort out of jail by the magistrates and the leaders of the city and who publicly, uh, publicly apologized to them. Now the Christian community has a certain status there and a respect that will be very helpful to them. And verse 40, let's end with this again. So when they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, they encouraged them and departed. And they left the church there in Lydia's house the first church in Europe and they didn't wow. need a, a male covering <laughs> they didn't need no. any of the paraphernalia <laughs> that people are told today that's tr so true they had the scriptures they had the Holy Spirit. They had the gospel that Paul had left They had the, the gospel message called the charisma. They had the message. Paul gave them the right message. It wasn't full of fluff and error. It was the basic message, and it was about lifestyle. It's about how they would now live and be a light in that community. Amen. So these chapter 29 groups all over the world, some of them will be in the homes of women. Not all of them, but some of them will be. Just like in Lydia. And there's an example of it. First church in Europe. There's so much more I would like to say, but we've got to stop. Oh, would you pray with me? Let's lift our hearts up to God. 
In the last days, God said, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And we don't go overboard on defining that as some spooky thing that people do when they stir up their creative imaginations. We're talking about men and women speaking the speaking, Word of God. Speaking, being inspired and moved by God to speak forth God's truth. Yes, that's what we're speaking of. And that can also, some interpret that as meaning simply teaching and preaching. That is often overlooked amongst mm -hmm. charismatic right. people today, revival sure. people. But we need to take the limits off yes. that narrow meaning and get out of this stirring up creative imaginations and get back into the mm -hmm. Word of God and take His Word and let the appropriate message from God be spoken in any situation. Yes, amen. That's a prophetic word. Yep. So God, in these days, since yes. Jesus rose again from the dead, He is using both men and women, Absolutely. And, and even and children, to speak forth an appropriate on-time word. And this is the message God wants us to get out because He wants to mobilize His people all over the world. God wants to mobilize his people and we have a small part to play in this. And we just want to do our small part in God's big plan. That's all he asks of all of us. So I want to encourage you tonight, don't stop, don't quit. Continue on. Look for your suddenly, it will come. God's going to use all of us in these days when God's pouring out His Spirit. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters out there tonight that are joined together with us in this live stream, in this live webcast. Oh God, we thank you for the opportunity to be alive in this day, in this time, in this hour. And Lord, we receive from you tonight. Oh, we receive, Lord, the downpouring of your Holy Spirit. We receive your encouragement. We receive the refreshing of your presence and of your spirit, O oh God, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the authority that you've given us over Satan and his minions. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that we are more than conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. We give you praise for it all in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. There you know, are Eddie, some, uh, as human beings... Uh, we have weaknesses, mm -hmm. and one weakness of many human beings, men and women, is an insecurity. Mm -hmm. And so, when someone who appears, are you going to listen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, yeah, just gotcha. hold yeah. steady a minute, will you, in case sure. you need to flow with this? Yes, okay. Um, it's hard for me to pick up my thought now. Um, in that, uh, that human state. Yes. When someone who comes along and is very confident and, you know, dresses the part and speaks the part, thus saith the Lord, I'm the woman of God, I'm the man of God. Mm. Many not so confident Christians are, are, are lured by that. And, you know, you and I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we do. In people prophesying. Oh, absolutely. We're not against Holy Spirit speaking the Word of God mm -hmm. by the unction of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We are all for that. Absolutely. But what we see today are so many precious people being lured away by these prophetic words. And I want to say, no, no, mm. no. Listen to the Holy Spirit in your heart. Yes. Let there be a witness in your inner person. Amen. That will determine, is that person speaking God's will? Or is that person just saying some things to entice me, to lure me? This is a very, very important distinction today. Mm -hmm. And we learn, I think, as we go along how to identify that witness of the yes. Holy Spirit Amen. in our hearts. And that, I, you know, if, mm. if people didn't get one other thing out of tonight, I'm sure that people got many things, but 
I do hope and pray that they will be alert to that if right. they're not already. Now, I'm sure. not assuming that everyone mm -hmm. has sure. a deaf spirit, okay? I mean, a, a, a heart that's deaf to the voice of the right. Holy sure. Spirit. Yeah. But I'm saying, don't be lured by that person who comes along mm. and plays into your insecurities right. sure. and comes with, I am God's person in this hour. Right. Be careful of that, because if you're really God's voice, mm -hmm. God's vessel, you don't have to tell anybody. Right. You just be who you are. Yes. And Amen, let Sue. God use you. That's good, Sue. Yep. No ego Amen. trips. Just, That's good, Sue. Amen. You know, you don't have to announce who you are. Just do. Just be. Hallelujah. Just do it. Just be and do. Yeah. Those simple, step by step. Amen. Things that God, the Holy Spirit, would nudge you to do, and use common sense. Amen. Amen. There's a couple of of uh, part of our streaming family. You know, my uh, it's interesting. My uh, I went over to my chat see, and it's just working, 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 working. Don't worry about Chatsy tonight, Eddie. Chatsy's having troubles. Yeah, I, I just went over. Uh, Jim Hamilton says, Sue, the TV is so HD. And tell Please tell Sue to pass me some of that chicken salad. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, we got some. Um, tell Jim that what he's getting is not even the highest quality that this TriCaster will produce. We're streaming which is a lesser quality than what we do when we tape for television. Right, right. Yeah, there's something lost any time you stream. And let's just take a minute here, Eddie. Yeah. We're going to put what we have on the screen right now Okay. is the, um, let me see. Um, okay, this is the, no, wrong one. Just let me get the right. And I have several emails from people who yeah, were okay. on the streaming. Just we'll get be, to those in a moment. Be patient a minute, because yep. I want people to see. Yes. Jim says that this particular picture is really sharp on his 72-inch HD TV, and that is such a blessing. Now, when I switch to the second camera, this is the camera that we need to re replace. Okay? Mm -hmm. People are seeing the second camera the product of the second camera right now. Right. Very, very different. Mm -hmm. But I'll go back to the first camera, yep. the good camera, and we'll, uh, that that they're getting is not even the highest quality that this TriCaster will produce when we put it on mm -hmm. record for TV. Right. We're just putting it on stream for the internet. So this is so incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm, s I'm looking forward so much to mobilizing um, some some men and some women to participate with me and with you in a God's Word to Women TV program, a weekly 30-minute mm -hmm. TV program. I'm looking forward to that. I don't have to do it all. I yep. do need to be involved. Mm -hmm. I need to give it some steering. At times I need to be on camera, mm -hmm. which means I've got to find a person or some people who will learn, as I have over the past year, to learn this equipment. Um, we need people to equip. I, I want to say this. We really need people to equip themselves with this technology right. and come here prepared to do the things that I'm doing so that I they can share the responsibility so that I can do some of the things that other people can't do. Right. Okay, that's really important. I, so many people think that ministry is just like you're doing, being in front of the camera yeah. and, and so on and so forth, or getting in a pulpit, preaching, leading. But ministry is so much more than that. Yes, it is, Sue. And one of the things that's needed today to increase the voice of our friends, of our voice and the voice of our friends and partners that God is moving on to be his voice is that we need some people to learn to use this TriCaster mm. equipment. Yeah. It's not hard. That's true. But it, but it's something just like every other skill. Every person has had to learn certain skills to be successful true. in certain things. Yeah. 
that they do in life and that they do for the Lord. And what I'm interested in doing is saying, find out, is, do you have a heart to learn to do this? And if you do, then go ahead and get busy and take a course in TriCaster, take a course in video production, mm. take a course in studio lighting. Mm -hmm. You know, if you watch the, the, the uh, what do they call it when they show who's participated in producing a movie or a the, TV? The, uh, the, the, uh, the um, there's a word for them. The credits. The credits. When you see credits roll, I mean, that's no joke. <laughs> it takes so many more people behind the scenes than it does in front of the camera. You're doing the work of about 10 people, sir. At least 10 <laughs> people. And I've had to learn. Yeah. I've had to learn. I've had to take my time away from my writing and my studying and other things that, uh, that God put me on earth to do. And I'm not complaining. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this to say, if I can do it, mm -hmm. you can do it. Yes. And I'm saying, come on, folks. Go ahead and equip yourself mm -hmm. with the skills of this hour to participate in, in a team to get this gospel message out. Now, Eddie, would you share what you said to me the other day about how God impressed on you while you were having one of your walking times, prayer times, about how this particular area, this doctrine, this particular area is part of what he's telling you will help to bring that outpouring of the spirit that is needed today. Would you pick you, up you, that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I have, you know, this is one of the things that's intrigued me ever since I became a believer and, and I started reading, you, you, you know, revivalist books, T.L. Osborne, Charles Finney, and, and on from there, John Wesley, and, and it's, it, and, and, and I have seen some some local revivals, powerful ones at times through the, through the years. And, and it's something that I know God has given me and he's, he's, he's brought it back again to emphasize and call people to pray for revival in America and other countries too. It's the only hope, it's the only answer. This country is going downhill fast and the only thing that is going to stop it is not another election, another politician. It is a great awakening. But as a, and, and so I, I have started this TV program called Revive America and a blog called Revive America. But as I was walking, I've always known, especially, especially for the last few years, that this whole message of mobilizing the body of Christ, men and women, according to their gifts and callings and, and, and not gender, it is a vital part of the message and God reminded me of this the other day when I was walking doing a prayer walk and praying and praying for revival and I felt God just spoke in my heart and saying this is a part of bringing the revival of emphasizing the gender equality in Christ of destroying this this misogynist and, 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 and this male dominant theology that would push women out and keep them from exercising and functioning in their gifts and callings. I felt God said in my heart by preaching this message, this is an important part of bringing about this revival that you want to see, that I've put in your heart to see. So folks, I believe this, but, but not only is, is this message important, for evangelism, for reaching the Muslim world, this message is a key for bringing about spiritual awakening in America, Ireland, England, so on. I believe that with all of my heart. This is not just some kind of little women's ministry to help women feel better about themselves. Amen, this it. is a church issue. Yes. This is a missions issue. Yes. This is an awakening issue for Canada, for America, Ireland, for England, Central for the world. For America, for South America. Yes, yes, for, for Andrea America. in Costa Rica, she's for our friends all over the world. Andrea is on tonight. Andrea, God bless you. Thank and you for I the work you know, do. And I need to know, Andrea, a deadline. I I'm, I'm, hope I have not missed my deadline to give you a list of Greek words for your dissertation and your master's thesis. And I feel the stirring in good, my heart, good, even good. as I am sharing this, yes. I know Oh, it's true. Even I'm sharing it, I have the confirmation in my heart that this message is a key for evangelism in the world, in the Muslim world. It's a key for bringing revival Eddie, to this we world. Can, we, in our studies of church history, we 
uh, in addition to the general church history uh, story, we we went and we studied revivals in church history, and we learned. I think you will agree with me uh, in this. We learned that in each uh, outpouring of the Spirit, let's start with Luther. Luther's day is not over. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not. We, we won't go down that path. Uh, but we'll just let's start with him. What would you say was the key doctrine in in the Reformation awakening? Well, it was directing people back to Scripture. Back to Scripture and the priesthood of all believers. Yep. There was a doctrine there. Mm -hmm. Okay. In looking at the Bible, he helped them to see that each person was directly connected to God through Jesus Christ mm -hmm. by faith. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what was? Let's let's move ahead to another revival in history. Give me one, just anyone. Well, let's let's, let's say the uh, Methodist revival. All right, go go for it. What would you say was the key issue there? The key doctrine that brought that saved England from a terrible. A uh, bloody revolution such as France had when they denied. Well, I, I'm going to use Lord. a phrase a friend of ours used. We heard many years ago that the Methodist revival democratized holiness. In other words, they emphasized holy living, whereas the general church had left that to these monks who lived all alone out in these monasteries. You know, they were the ones that were holy. And Wesley preached, "No, God has called all of us." <laughs> To live holy lives before God, okay, that and, was and, the and the new birth. They emphasized a new birth that you couldn't do it on your own; that it had to be done through a new birth through okay. Jesus Christ well, and His Holy Spirit. Well, let's move ahead then to let's say the turn of the nine the nineteen hundreds and the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, in nineteen early nineteen hundreds. Yeah, the Pentecostal revival. No, what was the key doctrine there that brought this deluge of outpouring? This baptism out, in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, I think we could say that there was a the doctrine of healing, divine healing, mm -hmm. through F. F. Bosworth and John G. Lake and a number of others like that. Yeah, those people emphasize in that revival emphasized the doctrine of healing right mm -hmm. yeah okay then Parham and the P Pentecostal outpouring the doctrine that was emphasized that brought the great outpouring mm -hmm. was the baptism in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues mm -hmm. now as we go along and we come to uh, uh, another revival say in the in the in the 20th century what would you say would be one the charismatic charismatic one? renewal yeah. we could say maybe the healing the renewal of the healing revival yeah and the gifts of the holy Gordon spirit Lindsay and tl osborne mm -hmm. and daisy osborne and and the voice of healing they brought back to the forefront the doctrine of divine healing okay mm -hmm. and that brought a great outpouring of the spirit mm -hmm. all right so we go along i'm I'm with you in believing that a key to the outpouring right. of the Holy Spirit in our day is this awareness that the Bible teaches the equality of women and men in terms of substance and value, privilege and responsibility, function and authority in ministry, in the home, and mm -hmm. in all areas of life. Right. That same Holy Spirit dwells equally in each person who receives. Right. And each is a vessel of honor to the degree that they give themselves to God. And it's it's that indwelling of the Spirit in the individual child, man, or woman that radiates out to the yes. environment Amen. around them and creates an environment conducive to God coming in power and doing what he wants to do to change people's lives to help people to heal people to amen. empower people to make good choices in life amen amen so this is th this is why this particular doctrine is important today yes it's yeah. a church issue it's a mission issue it's a revival issue yes God wants to mobilize his people, absolutely. Hey, Linda Miller in Tulsa. Linda Miller, longtime friend, good friend, and uh, a, a board member of God's Word to Women. She says, she she's uh, commenting on the thing about the, uh, the flattery and true encouragement. Yes, so important to discern between flattery and true encouragement. Good word to share this important insight. 
it, it, in addition, it means we sometimes will not be perceived as nice. Nice is often caused by allowing manipulation and because of insecurity. Nice is often not a good thing. Real and honest is the best, how Jesus lived. Amen, Linda. God bless you and thank you so much. Uh, and apparently the uh, Sue and Tom Wood, the, the, the quality is not good tonight. Now, uh, uh, she says your, she, your stream has always had such beautiful co uh, quality. What is the problem tonight? Well, it's on their end. It's uh, on this I, Sue, I think it, it's probably maybe your, on, on your end because other people have uh, emphasized what a clear, sharp picture they're getting. So, uh, so that's something I'm not sure. Ildi in Pensacola says, Thank you for the streaming today. I'm so excited about the great influence of the Muslim world. Blessings and love. Ildi. Amen. Uh, Ken. Uh, Ken Woolley. Ken and Karen, God bless you. So, so thankful for you. Uh, friends in Northport, Alabama, enjoying your teaching tonight. Thank you so much. We have two s streaming friends, part of this family that needs prayer tonight. And... Um, our friend Dina in England is having very serious intestinal problems. And our friend Carmel, Carmel, who is on regularly, but as far as I know is not on tonight, has a broken collarbone. And they both are wanting and desiring prayer. Uh, Richard in Massachusetts says, very clear image here. Steve in Tulsa uh, says looks good here steve in tulsa so glad you're on tonight stephen say hi to your mom and we've got to connect soon uh we have just been overwhelmed with, with busyness but we want to connect with you rich uh with you uh stephen we're, we're <coughs> close enough now we can do it andrea says you still have time sue okay good good i'll get that i'll get on to that this week andrea very good. Um, I want it before you pray for Carmel to be relieved of pain. Her shoulder has blade has healed, but she still has pain, and she's taking therapy, physiotherapy. Uh, she specifically asked that everyone pray for her tonight. She's yes. in a receptive state to receive healing. And Dina in England, yes. with this intestinal problem, she has asked that we pray for her. Um, so I and these are people who are closely connected yes, with with, yes. with all now, of us here, this family. Before we do that, I would like to um, read what. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, oh, in Tulsa, Gladys, Gladys. Gladys. I could picture <laughs> you, and I just couldn't pull up your name. My I'm friend so Gladys. Sorry. Yes. Gladys says yes, Sue. The church leaders and believers must get the revelation of equality in the spirit and realize that it's not male gender in control but the spirit of the lord working in through working in and through male and female who give themselves to the lord and to his service so thank you gladys appreciate that affirmation of course um now people are beginning to go off eddie and, so, uh, and uh, Andrea says the streaming is sharp in Costa Rica. She says it looks a, She says it looks high definition. All right, excellent. Great, excellent. And and Steve, we've prayed for him for work, and uh, and uh, and he's working eight a.m. to five to six p.m. Working long hours now. And he says, haven't done nine to five for an entire week in a long time. <laughs> so, so Steve is back working full time. God bless you, Steve. I, I can remember people praying for you in the prayer room. And Ken is on in the prayer room. Uh, Tara in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And Delilah and Charles up in Paris. Richard in Massachusetts. Dorothy in Nova Scotia. Becky in Tulsa. Becky, glad you're on. And as I mentioned, Steve in Tulsa. Steve, and I guess Corey is on. God bless you, Corey. Amen. I know, Amen. I know you're so happy to have Steve back with you there in Tulsa. We've got to get together I sometime. I will always remember. Uh, and Michelle Steve in Seattle is on Steven's tonight. Steve's parents, uh, Corey and Richard. Richard has passed on to heaven now. But I will always be thankful to them for their amazing support when we 
uh, they still, the support is still there, but I mean it was manifest in a meaningful way when we uh, f moved to Tulsa. And um, I was asked to speak at Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, on this particular topic. Right. And uh, I think I, I don't know, I had maybe three sessions where mm. I needed to sp uh, speak the message. Yeah. And uh, Corey and mm -hmm. Richard drove all the yeah. way from Tulsa to Cleveland, right. Tennessee. To show support. To show support. Right. You know, my art is full as I share that. That yeah. was so special. Um, praise the Lord. And uh, Stephen Tulsa says, we'll work it out, Eddie and Sue. He's talking about getting together. He says, and happy birthday, Sue. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Ann Ken is on tonight. Yes. And I mentioned Michelle in Seattle. Michelle, so glad you're with us. Keep us updated about what's happening there because you're one of those women leaders that God has raised up in this hour. And Ken, streaming coming through clear in Toronto. So glad to hear that, Ann. God bless you. And Darcy up in Maine is on, but uh, she's having a problem getting the sound. Now, Darcy, are you um, you're there in the prayer room, though? Uh, are you are you? Yeah, we need to help her to get some speakers to plug into her laptop. Yeah, something we need to do there. We'll yeah. see if there might be some here that we're not using that are in good shape. We'll see, folks. I I believe I believe. God and, bless and Darcy. God bless Darcy. She's the, she is in her mid fifties. Just yeah. lost her husband, who was a Vietnam War vet, and she is pressing through, walking life day by day with the Lord. And she's asked of us if we would agree with her, for favor with I believe it's the bank. I don't know for a loan, a two thousand dollar loan. Would y'all pray with Darcy? Would you agree with her? She, yes. she, she's in need, and she. Uh, we met her for the first time just yeah. recently yeah, we had when we passed through Maine. Yeah. And we had a really good visit with her. She's a sincere follower yes, of Jesus, she and she's in need right now. And uh, let's pray for God to meet her need. Yes, do it. To Lord. give her favor. Lord, yeah. we, we agree in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with our friend Darcy in Maine. Yes. Give her favor and meet this need according to your riches in glory. Amen. Amen. Uh, Dorothy in Nova Scotia says, Please pray for a friend on the emergency list to have hip and femur replaced. She is a lovely woman of God confined to house in pain. The surgeons need eight hours in OR and not being able to get the time, and not being able to get the time. She wants a miracle. I visited and prayed with her on Sunday. She wants a miracle and knows God is able to do this. Asking for prayer for her, please. So, well, Lord, we, yeah, we, we pray for this friend of Dorothy. Yes, in God, would you intervene for her sake and for your glory, for the honor of your name's sake? Would you visit this person? Show them your strength and your power and your deliverance. We ask it, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I want to say to you before we go tonight, Paul and Silas saw a suddenly, suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Reminds me back in Acts 2, suddenly there was a sound from heaven. Don't quit. Don't stop. Persevere in faith, prayer, praise. Your suddenly will come. Hallelujah. Well, it's one of those nights I kind of hate to leave, but we've been, we've been going for over two hours as far as the streaming is. But let me say, it's so thankful for every one of you and for the part you play in our lives, whatever it is, for your encouragement, for your prayers, for your support, thank you so much. There's a passage in the Old Testament, despise not the day of small beginnings. What we're doing may seem small right now, but folks, I believe we're having and we will have a great impact for the glory of God. <laughs> and there's Sue back from Crowley. She says, we adjusted our own computer. <laughs> the problem was not your broadcast. <laughs> the quality is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Sue, for, for sharing that with us. Because <laughs> we're always concerned. We want people to, 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 to get the good quality. Hallelujah. Tom and Sue Wood, such a blessing. God bless you, Tom and Sue. So thankful for you and your friendship. A as we are for all of you. Lord, just bless all of our friends out there tonight. And uh, Ann Ken says... I hear your heart cry, Sue, praying with you for the help to come as you are free to continue writing and teaching. And Sue, I heard you say this. I know this is what you were saying. 
that when you start this God's Word to Women 30-minute TV program, which will will start on the TV station in Paris and then put it on the God's Word Women YouTube and then we'll go from there. Who knows where it will no, go. No, sure, these programs but you are quality people. enough that they can go on local TV programs. And you want people to, to do these programs rather. in front of the camera. You're not wanting to do all of them. You want people oh, to, no, I don't want to do them all. Uh, no, to do no, teachings no. or do interviews or whatever, maybe do something with you or on their own, but you want other people yeah. to be involved in doing these. You know, Linda Miller and um, uh, uh, Becky Duncan in Tulsa might come down and the two of them do a program. Or do several. Or do more than one program together. Right. Oh, they're, just take the limits off. Yes. That's, that's the deal. The we want to take the limits off here. God, folks. Let's take the limits off and, and let the Lord increase the volume of what of His voice through us. And, 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 and we have a new camera coming. And I just, I just want, in my heart, I just want to mention that, not to pressure anybody, because we always... A value is to look to God as our source and let God speak to hearts. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, but D.L. Moody made this statement one time. He says, look, tell people, but look to God. So I just want to say, in case somebody didn't know this, we're believing God to be able to purchase another camera that is equal in quality with the one that came with the other studio equipment. When we bought the TriCaster, the, li the professional lighting, and all of that, we bought one camera because we were trying not to, you know, overextend ourselves financially. God gloriously provided. Now, the second camera is the one that we used when we didn't have the studio equipment, and it's much less quality. Okay, uh, so, what I'm doing now is I just showed camera one. Uh huh. Now I'm going to show camera two. So I'll just ask all of you just to be in agreement. And our friends... Uh, um, Paul and Eileen, they sent us a professional tripod that they had on hand, mailed it to us for the camera. So we've got the cam we've got the tripod for the Look camera. At camera two. There's camera two. I'm looking at camera two. Move over to your right. So uh, move over to my right. <laughs> Not How's too that? far. <laughs> so there I'm on camera two. So look at camera two. This is the camera we need to replace. That's the one we need to replace. Okay. Now go back to camera one. So, just be in agreement. Just pray with us and be in agreement. And we're confident that God will supply according no, to no, His riches no and glory. No pressure. No pressure. Nope. Thank you, Lord. Well, so, thank, uh, again, thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you for being our friends. You know, before you do that, Eddie, yeah. good note from Gladys in Tulsa. And I'm okay. thinking, you know, there are friends on, like Gladys, whose uh, who's native tongue is other than English. Why have those people do English God's Word to women? Why not? Gladys can do English, but wow, she could do a program in her native tongue. Absolutely. Uh, Andrea, when she comes again, can do programs in, in Spanish. Spanish. You know? And we might find somebody to do a program in Farsi, the Persian tongue of the Iranians. Sure. Uh, who knows how God is going to use this. Yes. Oh, Folks, hurry, people, hurry. Move, take the limits move, off God. Move into it. Let's So did you it. want to read something there from Gladys? Oh, no, that, uh, that was my response. That was it, yeah. Oh, oh right, right. I'm just responding that you know, she was truly blessed. And that blessing can be multiplied through Gladys to those who speak her native language in India. The, the blessing is growing in my heart here tonight. So I, I, I'm just so thankful to God and I'm so thankful for all of you out there, the friends that he has given us. So thankful that you are a part of this ministry. And, and I know that for many of you, it's, it's like Paul when Luke described it, that Paul had the vision and then Luke said that immediately we, Paul had the vision, but then he said we, who's we? It's Luke, it's Silas, it's Timothy. He said, then we immediately made plans to go to Macedonia, assuming that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel there. I have no doubt that God has not just called Sue and me to this ministry, but there is an us out there that God has called us us hallelujah well, we God go. thank you so much for what you have done in our hearts tonight we give you praise we give you glory Lord I just desire 
that you'll encourage every person that's been on this stream tonight that they will lie down tonight. Their hearts will be encouraged. Their hearts will burn with encouragement and with hope in the name of Jesus Christ. And God, I want to ask you, I want to pray. Would you pray with me for this situation in Ferguson, Missouri? You know, the other day, at the first time this uh, black highway patrol captain spoke, I saw on TV, I saw people out on the streets with signs glorifying Jesus and so on. But there are agitators who have come in. Let, let's pray that God will just continue to supernaturally intervene and he will douse the flames of anger and turmoil that Satan is trying to, to bring about there and that in the end God will be glorified there in that situation. So Lord, we pray for the people in Ferguson, Missouri. We ask you to intervene. We ask that your voice will be heard through your, your people who are there, black and white, brown and red, whatever it may be. Let your voice be heard through your people in that situation and bring a peace and a calm and let your name be honored and glorified, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And I bless my friends out there on this stream. Meet their every need. Open the windows of heaven upon them and meet their every need according to your riches and glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And well, God I, bless you I all. Would dare to, I would dare to reiterate one thing since sure. I'm still here. I would ask God to open people's understanding to what skills that he would have them learn regardless of their age, what skills Absolutely. God would have them learn to meet the opportunities that technology provides today Amen. to get the truth out. Amen, Sue. That God will open the eyes of our eyes and the eyes of our friends and partners to the skills that he would have them learn yes. in order to be more effective vessels for him and more productive members of his team. In Jesus' name. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you tonight. We bless your holy name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you. I could search for all eternity long and find there is like you. No, there is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you And oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you Sing with me Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you I will seek you in the morning. I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step you'll lead me. I will follow you all of my day. I will follow you all of my days. I will follow you all of my days and step by step.
you lead me and I will follow you all of my day oh God you are my God and I will ever praise you oh God you are my God and I will ever praise you I will seek you in the morning I will learn to walk in your ways and step by step you lead me and I will follow you all of my days God bless you can't wait to see you next week as we continue this theme out of Acts. Hallelujah.